So the next thing I'd like to talk about is a question that I get a lot, and you, you see me in my videos, I, I often jokingly talk about how I got wife approval, and I get questions all the time, or people are amazed, like, wow, really? You know, how did you do that? And uh, that question comes up fairly frequently, so I thought I'd talk to that for just a second. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's really, really important that you have a support system, right? And when I first broached the, the, the notion of building an airplane and passed it under the nose of she who makes decisions, um, it wasn't received really well. It, but just because it, it, it is an expensive concept. You know, it's something that's like, wow, really, ooh, that's gonna be scary. But after showing her the numbers of, uh, just in general aviation in general, uh, showing her the price comparison of a kit built plane versus a certified aircraft, she was pretty far on board. But what really sold it was making her part of the process. And I think this is something that you need to do with your spouse, is make them part of the process. And I'm not just talking about the build, right? My wife's come out and helped me a couple times on things when I haven't been able to do it all by myself and you're never gonna be able to do it all by yourself, your arms just aren't long enough in some cases. But I'm also talking about mission. I had a mission, you have a mission when it comes to your aircraft, whatever it is. But what a lot of people don't realize is quite often your passenger has a mission too. So for example, my wife's mission, one of the things she was really keen on was doing pilots and paws or the other dog rescue, you know, transport an animal from place to place kind of stuff. I hadn't really thought about that up until then. It kind of got me excited about it. I love the idea now. But that was something that was more important to her. And so we couldn't do that in like an RV-8, right? We, we would have needed the bigger plane. And so her mission was actually the thing that allowed me to upgrade to the 10 from, uh, we were looking at like eight, nine and 14. We were looking at the smaller, uh, smaller aircraft. But yeah, I think bringing your spouse on board is not just about convincing them that you're gonna spend a bunch of money and that they're gonna have to come out and help you. Because at that point, it's like, what, you're volunteering me for work? No, of course, they're not gonna be on board for that. However, if you sell it differently, put it on its ear and make them part of the process, not just the decision-making process, not just letting them choose the color of the plane, I swear to God, I'm gonna have a pink plane, but also allow them to uh, you know, give their input with regards to the goals that they want to achieve. And that worked for me. Um, you know, my wife is a saint. First of all, she's married to me. Uh, terrible taste in men. But uh, she's the one who made the decision that we should get the bigger plane because of some of the things that she wanted to do. I was on board. I mean, didn't get much pushback from me, as you might imagine. Uh, the only thing that I brought up was, hey, it is going to be more expensive. Oh, that's okay. So uh, try that. Try to bring them on board into the decision-making process, into the mission. You know, try to, 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 don't just try to convince them by twisting their arm, but actually make it so that they make the decision. And if they make the decision, <laughs> you win. <laughs> so uh, there you go. One other thing is a couple people uh, made some excellent points about my previous video where I talked about affording uh, an aircraft of this nature versus a, uh, you know, a Cessna or the Cirrus or whatever else. And two of them, uh, two, two points that I think bear mentioning, one of the extra costs that you're gonna have to take into consideration is hangar costs, electricity um, and consumables, you know, things that you use up, drill bits and things like that. Uh, those costs, I think one are minor. I mean, like the number of drill bits you're gonna use I mean, they're like two or three dollars each. It's, it's just such a minor thing. It's kind of counting pennies versus dollars. The hangar fee, I mean, you need a place to build. Uh, you can start in your three car garage. And I did, in fact, for a while, I was building in my garage. I eventually got to the point where two things happened. One, I just wanted my garage back. But two, I, I got into a, a situation where I got a real good deal on a hangar. Uh, and so I'm renting this hangar from a fellow who just desperately needed someone to rent it from him. Real good guy and gave me a good a good deal on it and the electricity here, it, he's paying for it. So it's not like I'm using a bunch. It's kind of a communal tea hanger. So honestly, yeah, that's a cost, but at the same time, that's a cost you're probably gonna have if you own a plane either way, you're gonna wanna hanger your plane, I assume. I mean, you could put it out on the ramp, but yeah, I wouldn't do that. So that's, even though yes, that is a cost, it could cost you know anywhere from 200 to $400, depending on where you are. 
I just don't think that I don't think that's one you, I mean, it's definitely one you need to take into consideration, but it's not one that really matters with regards to certified versus experimental, because it's kind of a cost you're gonna have either way. Now, the other cost that is an excellent point, and I, I thought of this, and I didn't want to bring it up just because I was, that was already a really long running rant as it was, is maintenance. Maintenance on a certified aircraft versus an experimental aircraft is, there's a ridiculous difference. I mean, the, the cost of, maintaining a experimental aircraft is, I don't want to say negligible, but it is so low because you're, you're doing it yourself. If you've built the aircraft, then you are, uh, I don't know what they got, green lighted, thumbs up by the, the FAA uh, to do the maintenance on that aircraft yourself. Whereas with a certified aircraft, you have to bring it to a mechanic who can actually do the work for you. And of course they charge hourly. Uh, whereas you are the mechanic that's certified to do that aircraft, uh, to, to do your experimental aircraft. So uh, that's a huge difference. In fact, uh, one of my viewers was telling me that uh, where they are, now they're not in America, but where they are, there's a lot of hoops that they have to jump through in order to satisfy that certified aircraft maintenance. Like every 100 hours, you know, it could cost ten to fifteen thousand dollars just to maintain an aircraft that's in perfect working order that sucks so that uh, that's huge and someone was telling me uh, in one of these other hangars who has a he has a twin uh, but his his uh, yearly costs on maintenance are ridiculous because he has to do everything not only for a certified aircraft but twice because he's got two engines so that is another huge, huge thing to take into consideration uh, that maintenance costs for an experimental, uh, an experimental aircraft, even experimental aircraft that you bought from somebody else is usually a lot less. So great point guys, I really appreciate you bringing that up. That's, that's good stuff. so many holes. You know, honestly, I remember now why I didn't want to do both wings at the same time. And it's this, there are so many holes. Not only do you have to pre-drill every hole, uh, but you also have to then go through and countersink every hole. And each hole has a different purpose, whether it's a nut plate hole, whether it's a skin hole or whatever. There's so many different holes. You have to do them all slightly differently. Actually, let me show you. So here I am, I've got my spar in front of me. This is the right wing spar. It works exactly like the left wing spar. Just remember when you're working on this thing that everything is mirrored, except in this case, when you're drilling these holes, uh, you're gonna be doing the exact same thing. Um, now, each of these flanges on the main spar have 360 holes per side, and they have different purposes. Uh, many of the holes, uh, especially towards the inboard portion of the spar, that's this way, uh, are for holding the tank on, the fuel tank on, which means those are machine countersunk for nut plates. And the rest of them are for wings. Now each nut plate hole has two types of hole. One is for the nut itself, and then the, the two on either side of it, in most cases, some are different types of nut plates, are for uh, the, the rivets that actually hold the nut plate on. You have to machine countersink different depths based on what it's gonna be used for. And that's actually discussed in the instructions pretty well. If it's going to be just holding the nut plate on, then you're gonna use a standard rivet, drop it in there, and you want it to be exactly perfectly flush with this. However, if you're gonna be using it for the skin, meaning it's a hole that's meant for skin, you need to create a little tool just out of a scrap piece of aluminum that will show you exactly how it's gonna sit down on there. So the, so the, skin, uh, the skin holes need to be slightly deeper. It's not difficult, right? I mean, it's just a lot. Uh, there's a lot of holes, 360 per side, and you do have to do them slightly differently based on how they're gonna be used. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's an event. Um, and I think that was the reason I think that I originally, if I, if I vaguely remember back that I just decided that, you know what, I'm gonna do one wing and then the other wing. 
Because then if you especially take into consideration the hundreds, like probably a thousand holes on each skin that you have to, you know, not only dimple, but you also have to pre-drill and, you know, match drill rather and get all lined up and, oh, it's just, it seems endless. Nut plates. Love them or leave them, you're gonna be dealing with a lot of them. I don't hate them, they're actually not terribly bad. They're, they're really clever. So a nut plate is one of those. Basically, it's a piece of aluminum that has been shaped such that it has three holes. Two holes for rivets to hold the nut plate itself to the medium, and one nut hole that is used to actually screw the nut in. The idea behind a nut plate is it allows you to temporarily attach usually one piece of skin or a fuel tank or something to another such that you can unscrew it and get access to what's behind it. You're going to be dealing with a lot of nut plates. Um, I have found that the, one of the best ways to deal with nut plates because they are a mass produced widget, right? They're, you know, that little nut plate is mass produced. I, Vans probably orders them by the truckload. Uh, the, because they're mass produced, they can sometimes get a little misshaped. Uh, one of the problems I've noticed is they get slightly ovoid, slightly elongated, uh, and, and that becomes a little bit of a problem. So how I've counteracted that typically is when I'm doing nut plate work, I'll go ahead and I'll put the nut plate in with the holes for rivets clecoed in, and then screw in the actual screw design for that nut plate to make sure it's in correctly. A lot of that is to, well, it, it does two things that I can think of off the top of my head. One is it acts as a third point of securing down the nut plate while you're working with it, but also it helps to shape that nut plate and make sure that it will work with the screw. Because I gotta tell you, I can't think of anything worse than getting a nut plate put on, the, putting the rest of the plane together, and then realizing that now you can't screw a screw into that nut plate because you never tested it. So this is just kind of covering your bases. Um, the other thing is with when you when you screw it in, when you screw the screw in to, to hold the nut plate on, you don't want to crank it down, right? Because that can actually cause the nut plate to deform even more. You want to put it down just finger tight so that you have access to the two holes either on either side or if it's one that has the two holes on one side and put the rivets in, you know, cleanly. Um, that's really the big thing with nut plates. Take your time with them. Make sure that you put a screw in every single one of them to make sure it is good because they are mass produced. It's very possible that you got one that was cross threaded or had debris in there or something. Um, and I would say definitely make help reshape and screw it down such that you, you know it's gonna work down the road. So that's it, nut plates. You're gonna be using a lot of them. So uh, just, just accept it and get used to working with them. So while I continue to plug away in the background on the right spar, uh, I thought I would close this video talking about uh, something that I get questioned about all the time, and that is priming. A very common question is, you know, are you going to prime? Should you prime? Uh, should you do any corrosion prevention? Uh, why haven't you done more corrosion prevention, etc.? And I think. Uh, it's, it's a good question. I mean, first of all, it's a religious debate, right? If you read on the forums, you'll see 100 people saying you should, 100 people saying you shouldn't. If you, or you don't have to, uh, if you look at the instructions even, it implies that you can, you don't have to. All of the instructions are written like, if you choose to prime, here's when to do it, etc. I have effectively at this point chosen to not prime. I started priming uh, the empennage parts of the empennage, specifically those non alkyd parts, using just rattle can primer. Um, and honestly, I, I've, I've kind of done away with that. The reason is because it adds effort, it adds cost, it adds weight, it adds time. And in my mind, the overall benefit, the gain that you get, seems really minor. Um, first of all, the rattle can self etching primer that I was using is just not very good. Uh, it worked. One might even argue it worked fairly well. Uh, and any place where there's non alcad parts that are open to the weather, I still kind of put a little sheen of primer on it. But the majority of the parts I've not primed. Um, the reason I don't like the rattle can now that having used a bunch of it is because it just scratches right off. Uh, I would say if you're going to prime, 
get the AKZO stuff, uh, which is extremely toxic. You need a respirator, but it is rugged. It is durable and it works really well. So that if you're going to prime, go that route. The reason I'm not priming, I think, again, aside from cost, weight, time, work, etc., is that I've flown on a bunch of planes that are old, older than me, and they're fine. Um, I think aluminum, and, and I want to hear from you guys on this one because y'all probably know better than I do. I think aluminum, by its very nature, uh, corrodes instantly in that it has a. There's always like a sheen of oxidization on all aluminum, but it's so minor that. It's just a patina that you, that's it. And that it doesn't go any deeper than that unless maybe you're around a lot of sea salt, maybe you're around the ocean. I don't know. Uh, but I can tell you for a fact that all the planes that I've flown, and, and admittedly, I mean, it's a bunch of 172s and 152s at this point, but none of them were primed inside. It's just raw aluminum in there. They look fine. Um, and I've seen tests online uh, where people have taken a hunk of aluminum, hung it outside next to a piece of steel and, you know, next to other stuff. And you can see definite corrosion on the steel and on the, you know, on, on various other metals, but the aluminum still just looked like aluminum, you know, maybe slight coloring change, but other than that, it was still aluminum. So I just don't see the value. Um, I don't know how much weight, like if you covered the entire plane in a wash of AKZO or, or rattle can primer or some other form, of, I don't know how much weight that would add, but it's probably not insignificant over the course of all the parts. Um, and time is huge. I mean, the amount of time and effort it takes to, to do all that primer is not insignificant. Uh, plus cost, right? Uh, it, it's going to cost money. So that's really my big thing. I mean, I think I'm taking firm hold of my laziness and not wanting to have to prime if I don't have to. And I just don't see the advantage. Um, I'm, I'm interested in hearing what you have to say. Like I said, it's a religious debate. A lot of people feel very strongly about the prime, don't prime uh, conversation. And I think I'm kind of in the don't prime camp uh, or that you just don't need to. If you want to, great. It might help resale value down the road. I mean, it might be one of those things that, no, I'm not going to buy that plane because it's not primered inside, right? Uh, whereas somebody who was buying a plane who didn't care one way or the other is not going to not buy the plane because you did prime it. Uh, so I don't know. Um, but I just, that's, that's my big thing with the primer. It's why I didn't do it. I just didn't see the advantage. It seemed like a lot of extra work for very little payoff. And ultimately I would be curious to see whether or not it's truly needed. Uh, I do know that a couple of the other old planes here on this airport uh, are not primed inside and they look fine. So that's it. That's my reasoning. Uh, is it sound? <laughs> your, your mileage may, may vary. I don't know. Uh, I fully expect to hear a lot of opinionated people. Like I said, this is a religious debate. There are a lot of people that are very, very, uh, uh, have strong beliefs one way or the other. And of course, uh, in the interest of starting a conversation, I'd love to know why you think I'm wrong. Please uh, comment below. And on that, I'm going to go ahead and shut it down. Thank you very much for all my Patreon supporters. I appreciate you guys more than you could possibly know. And for those of you that are new here, if you do me a favor and like and subscribe, it actually helps my rankings. So thank you very much, guys, and I'll see you next time.